We'd like to welcome you today to the uh, memorial service for um, Sister Mary Elizabeth Carroll. We'd like to thank all of those who have come to attend today, um, both here in person and virtually. Um, <clears throat> we'll begin this morning with, um, we, we've had a family prayer, and we'll um, begin this morning um, with an opening hymn. Um, the accompanist is Linda Switzler, and the chorister is Meg Glade. Um, my name is um, Bishop Cahoon, and I'll be conducting today, and um, I'd like to recognize President um, Rod Lizenby, who will be presiding. Um, so we'll start with the opening hymn, How Great Thou Art, uh, number 90, 86, and the invocation um, will then be given by Mike Taylor.
indeed grateful that, for this opportunity to be here in this wonderful setting, this wonderful land, and celebrate the life of Mary Garl. We're so thankful for the opportunity that we've had to have met her and lived within her midst and met her family and the joy that we've had from knowing her. We're so grateful for knowing her incredible commitment to thee and love for thy gospel. We ask thy blessing to be upon us this day that we might remember Mary in the fondest of lights and that we might be able to give love and share that with Jim and his family. We ask thy blessings to be upon Jim and in the coming days that he might have thy love and comfort from thee and that they as a family will travel safely to the Sacramento area and that they will again enjoy the family and comfort of that. Father, we ask thy blessings to be upon all those that will participate this day that they might be able to have clarity of mind and share the words that they've thought of that bring life to Mary and give us happiness. Again, Father, we're thankful for all that thou hast given us. And we say it's in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We'll proceed with the, the following program. Um, a life sketch will be given by Linda Strabeck, followed by Kate Graff. Um, she's not on the, on the program, but she's supposed to be there. So Kate Graff will give um, a, a, a talk. And then we'll have a, a musical number from the Sisters of the Seventh Ward, um, Each Life That Touches Our Ours for Good. Follow that musical number, there will be a, a speaker, um, Gail Evans. And uh, we'll continue to that point, um, and we'll, we'll announce it from, from there. Thank you. I got this at 10 o'clock last night from Dad, the things that he wanted me to say um, about Mary's life, because I only knew her the last 12 years, but you're going to hear about that. Okay, here we go. Mary was born. June 19th, in 1943, in St. Louis, Missouri. At the time, her dad was on active military duty in the Coast Guard. Coast Guard, Missouri, I'm, I'm okay. Um, probably out of the country. She was the third child, having an older brother and an older sister. And later, a fourth child was added, Gail. The family moved from St. Louis, Missouri, to Grass Valley, California, in about 1947. During her senior year, she was elected Honored Queen of Bethel 102. After high school, about 1961, she enrolled in a two-year program for medical secretaries. She finished in one year. Does that surprise anybody? No. Then she worked in, for about two years there in San Diego. Then she moved to Livermore, California, and started working for General Electric Company in the steno pool. She became assistant to the, oops, to the site manager in about five years. In 1969, she married Charles Chuck, who also worked at General Electric, and started her family with the first child born, Eric, about 1970. She continued to work with General Electric at the Valdez. Alcidos Nuclear Center, where she became an administrative assistant to the site manager. She moved to Colorado with her two children in Chuck in 1975. There they purchased 35 acres and built a home. They stocked the fields with cows and horses and chickens and kids. When General Electric Company left that area, they stayed and raised their young children along with numerous foster children helping them in their development. In the mid-80s, they moved back to Grass Valley, where Mary continued her efforts and energy and focus on helping and caring for people and her friends, neighbors, and the foster children. 
In fact, everyone she met. Czech developed some serious medical conditions and died of pancreatic cancer in 1988. After that, Mary focused her medical career in services, plus making a difference in someone's life. She suffered from se severe strokes, or several strokes, and from severe headaches. But in 1909, she and Jim were married, and that's where I were. And I gotta tell you, at first I wasn't too pleased with the idea of my dad getting married, because I thought I was gonna have him all to myself for a little while. But when they finally brought Mary out to meet me and my husband, it was instant love. Those of you who knew Mary know what I'm talking about. She taught me so many things. She taught me about generosity, about how she would spread it around. She always had a Christmas family that she and Dad were taking care of. She had all of these foster kids that she kept in touch with. She had an open heart. At one point in time, she had, we had a family reunion for Dad. And she invited my mom to come because their birthdays were close to the same time. So they went out to Kansas where my brother is. Mary welcomed her and invited her with such an open heart and even my half-sister. Everybody loved Mary. Human. Anybody remember Mary's stories? She loved to share the stories. She could find something to laugh about in the craziest things. She would call sometimes at night from the bathroom or from the closet, and we'd whisper and talk and visit back and forth until Dad would wake up and catch her. She says, your dad's coming. I gotta hang up. <laughs> she had a hard time sleeping and he didn't. So we visited a lot. At one point in time, she came to our, my house and helped me pack up my house to move. I worked her near to death. But at night, we'd sit there and eat those little packaged meals, those dinners, because Mary didn't eat a whole lot, so she was cheap. <laughs> Feed. And we'd sit there and eat those little meals and shred paper and make boxes and laugh and giggle. She got me through some pretty hard times with her sense of humor. She used to get caught grazing in the pantry. She'd hide her stash of candy and put it behind something, hoping Dad wouldn't find it. She'd go into the pantry and shut the door. Pretty soon, the door would open, and she'd go. <laughs> Ca caught again. He'd just shake his head and walk away. <laughs> they were an amazing couple. There was so much. Five minutes just doesn't do it. You could talk about Mary, how fun she was. We took, oh, this I got to tell you, okay. Dad, you close your ears. He's got to turn it off and we'll never be here anymore. Dad bought this new car. It was Mary's car. I don't think she ever drove it. But it was new, and we were coming back and forth between St. George and Highland. And Dad had left and left me with Mary and the new car. And he kept saying, don't go over 60 miles an hour. It's brand new. Okay. So we got in the car. As we're driving along, Mary looks at me and I look at her and she says, gun it. <laughs> <laughs> so we started going down and Dad started calling from Highland. He says, what's the mile marker? Where are you? So we tell him one about, you know, five miles back. <laughs> so by the time we got here, we had lots of time, so we went shopping. <laughs> I, I hope he doesn't hear that. <laughs> she was so fun. 
She was so funny. She was so loving. We called her Mary Mom. I know this name is spelled M-A-R-Y, but she was really M-A-R-R-Y. She was an amazing woman. But what I loved her for most was that when, they, when she and Dad were married, I heard my dad laugh, that big belly laugh that I remember from my childhood that had been gone for so long while they cared for Gwen. She brought that back. She brought the life back. And the last 12 years have been a real blessing, I know, to my dad, and I'm grateful for that. But she was such a blessing in everyone's life, and especially in mine. There's a primary song that I'm, I'm just going to speak it because mine, I'm not going to sing it, not now. But it's called, I'm trying to be like Jesus. I'm trying to be like Jesus. I'm following in his ways. I'm trying to love as he did in all that I do and say. At times I'm tempted to make a wrong choice, but I try to listen to the still small voice whispers, love one another as Jesus loves you. Try to show kindness in all that you do. Be gentle and loving in deed and in thought, for these are the things that Jesus taught. I'm trying to love my neighbor. I'm learning to serve my friends. I watch for the day of gladness when Jesus will come again. I try to remember the lessons he taught. Then the Holy Spirit enters into my thoughts, saying, love one another as Jesus loves you. Try to show kindness in all that you do. Be gentle and loving in deed and thought, for these are the things Jesus taught. This song, so is Mary. She wasn't trying, she did. Mary, we love you, and we'll see you soon. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our beloved brother and Savior. Amen. My husband was supposed to point to his head to remind me where my glasses were. Jim asked me if I would just tell you about my memories of Mary over the last 12 and a half years, I guess it is, that we've known each other. So I decided to start at the first and, and, and tell you about how Mary and I connected. Jim was a very sad and lonely man in the summer of 2009. My sister Gwen had passed away in April, and he was truly lost as to how he was supposed to move forward. Then Mary came into his life. Well, that isn't true, because he'd actually known Mary for many years. She was one of two great secretaries he had over the course of his career, and she was amazing at what she did. Jim actually arranged for Mary and her husband, who also worked for him, to transfer to Colorado so that Mary could continue working as his secretary while her husband ran the plant. She and Gwen had met several times and talked on the phone almost daily when Gwen needed to talk to Jim way before there were cell phones. So when she needed Jim to verify that her husband had actually indeed worked for him because of some records that had been lost, the two reconnected after many years. Jim took me to lunch and laid out the whole story, asking me if I thought it would be okay for him to marry again. He wanted my approval, I guess, because Gwen was my sister. Did I think it was okay? I thought it was great. I could see the light back in his eyes and the terrible deep sadness that had left. I had the sweet opportunity to be a witness at their marriage in the Lehigh Courthouse on November 19, 2009. They were like a couple of kids. <laughs> they were each so happy to have a close companion again in their life 
and they held hands and literally ran out the door into the parking lot when the ceremony was over. I loved Mary because she was so concerned that her marrying Jim so soon after might cause me pain. It did not. We became fast friends and got to know each other over the next several months and years as she helped Jim clean out closets and cabinets that held many of our family keepsakes. See, my mother had passed away three years prior, and Gwen had brought a lot of those things to her house to sort and discard and to give to family members. But she got sick before the job was finished, so Mary would not let Jim get rid of anything until she either A, asked if I wanted it, B, would someone in my family want it, or C, did I have their permission to take it to Goodwill? Sorry, I wish I, I didn't need the paper so much, but, but I do. Slowly the house changed from Gwen's to Mary's. Out went the pink dishes, in with the brass collection. Out with the pastels, and in with the rich, deeper colors. Out with the wallpaper, in with the freshly painted walls. Mary settled in, and you could see Mary everywhere in the house, exactly how it should be. She began attending church with Jim because she didn't want religion to be a divisive factor in their marriage. Over the weeks and months that followed, Mary investigated the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She loved what it taught about eternal families and other doctrines, but she wanted to know for sure if joining was the right thing for her to do, and she really struggled with that decision. She kneeled down one day to have a talk with God. She said, you know me. You know how I am. I need a direct, unrefutable, clear answer if being baptized into the church is the right thing for me to do. She got up from her knees and walked into the kitchen, and just then the doorbell rang. She answered the door, and two missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints stood on the porch. She looked up and pointed and said out loud, Okay, I got it. <laughs> I was delighted to be there the day that she was baptized. I also had the privilege of being her escort as she received her endowments in the Mount Timpanogos Temple later on. She listened to everything and asked many questions, and it was a great day. Mary became very involved in the ward, which is similar to a parish for those of you who may not be familiar with our faith. And she made many new and wonderful friends. She loved being a ministering sister. In the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the women often use the word sister when referring to each other because they love each other and they feel like sisters and they look after each other and watch out for each other. They're asked to watch over and care for one or two specific sisters in the ward so everyone will feel included and loved. You become a ministering sister to them. So Mary became a ministering sister and a dear friend to so many, and she loved sharing anecdotes and photographs about daily life lessons and simple pleasures. It was not uncommon to get an email from Mary telling a story about a duck or a deer she had encountered during the day and a photo attached with it especially during COVID. She did not let the fact that she was homebound stop her from ministering and sharing her stories and great love for and observation of nature. She loved visiting her many friends and loved having them visit her and would often give them little gifts to show her love and appreciation. It was always Mary's goal to lift others and leave them with a smile, to cheer the depressed, to visit with the lonely, and lend an ear to those who just needed to talk. She will be missed by so many. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says that Jesus went about doing good. Mary went about doing good. Mary was very much like Jesus. She was a Christ-like woman. Mary loved her family and would talk about her children and their families all the time and share photos of them with me. One summer, her granddaughter came out to spend some time with her and the granddaughter and I hiked to Tim Cake together and had a great time. Mary was so proud of her children and grandchildren. And Mary loved doing family history work and spent many wonderful hours searching records of ancestors, scanning family photos, and documenting her family's stories. Many times Mary would show me pictures of ancestors and share their stories with me. She was always so excited when she found out some new piece of information she could include in her family tree. And Mary loved Jim's family, too. She talked about Terry and Linda and James and their families as if they were her own. And she was so thrilled about the family reunion that you all had together in Kansas. 
She really wanted that to happen and talked about how great it had all turned out. What a loving and caring woman she was. My husband and I enjoy eating at Joe Bandito's in Springville with Jim and Mary a few times. And I would always compare what I ate with what she ate, which was hardly anything really. She'd take most of it home, which is why she looked so great. And Linda's story is a new one for me. <laughs> and she was always saying she needed to lose from five pounds. And I would say, where, from where? Where do you need to lose five pounds from? She would indulge occasionally, but she had the power of saying no to sugar. But I'm afraid I was a thorn in her side because I would sometimes sneak Jim's sugar treats. But now I find out she was sneaking her own. <laughs> Mary was very smart and articulate and knew so many things about so many, knew so much about so many different things. She read a lot because she always wanted to know the backstory about something. She shared some of her books with me and was anxious to know what I thought about this or that. She was interested in so many different topics. Before COVID, she and Jim enjoyed taking road trips to visit family and friends, and they spent many happy hours on the road, traveling to Kansas and New Mexico, southeastern Utah and California, and I would feed the fish and gather their mail. Because of her family history of strokes, she insisted that Jim do the driving because she refused to run the risk of endangering anyone else on the road should she have a stroke. She said she'd not be able to live with herself if that happened. Typical Mary thinking of others first. She would often quote her sister by saying, we, speaking of her family, don't know when we're going to die, but we know how we're going to die. And she was right, but then she usually was. I'm so grateful Jim brought Mary into my life. What a sweet, kind, loving, and caring woman she was to me and to so many others. The Savior said to love and to serve one another, and that is exactly what Mary did. We are all blessed to have known her, and we will carry her in our hearts forever. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
Thank you, Gail. Um, we'll, now, we'll now continue um, with a video presentation um, that are images from Mary's life. And so, if you're online, um, the, the funeral home is making sure that you'll be able to see that as well. And once that concludes, we'll announce the rest of the program. Thank you, James, for that special tribute. Um, we'll now hear from um, Rita Millar, followed by Melody Dyer, and I'll have some closing remarks. Um, our closing hymn will be Abide With Me Till Easy Even Tide, uh, number 166, and the benediction will be given by Brett Millar. Sorry, I tried to jump the gun earlier. Um, as a longtime neighbor and friend of the Carols, I, with many others, was very worried about Jim after Gwen passed away. He was so sad, and he seemed to be lost without her. Then for a while, he kind of disappeared, and then we heard that he went to California. When he came back, he had a wife, <laughs> Mary. And many of us were a little concerned about how quickly it all happened, but then as we heard the story and what, how it was, and we saw the change in Jim, we um, were thrilled for him and for her. We quickly learned that Mary was a lovely, Christ-like woman. She was friendly and cheerful, and she was so good for Jim. He was positive and happy again. Our old Jim was back. Mary attended church with Jim, and we got to know her better, especially in Relief Society, where she would participate in the lessons and make comments that showed how hard she tried to live a Christ-like life. I always enjoyed it when Mary got involved. She knew the Bible well and from all of her studies, and it really showed in the comments she made. One day years ago, Jim called and asked if I knew of someone who needed a car. They decided that uh, they would get rid of Gwen's car, and they wanted to give it to someone that could use it. And I couldn't think of any ready right off, and then I realized that my own daughter was really looking for a car. So I said, uh, how about Maggie? And Maggie had done some things for Jim and Mary, went, looked, watched out for their place when they traveled and stuff. I mean, they seemed to be happy to do that, but I said, she needs to buy it. We need to pay for it. So I very well remember the day when they came over, and Mary stood at the door and said, we've decided to sell the car to Maggie. We'll take one dollar. <laughs> so, as she said, I can see that it'd be good for her to pay something for it, but that's all it will take. So Maggie went over with her dollar <laughs> and came home with a Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> she loved driving it. It was a little big for her, and I remember the scrape that it got on the side, sorry Jim, when she went through the drive-thru to get some cash out of the ATM, and it's a little narrow. And that was a bigger car than she was used to, but it was a small one, and uh, she tried to buff it out. But um, she would sometimes tell Brett and I that if we behaved ourselves, that she would take us peasants on a ride in her Cadillac. <laughs> she enjoyed that car for quite a while, drove it and loved it. And then she had a friend that really needed a car, so she sold it to her for $1. One of our church leaders has said often of those that aren't um, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, bring us what truth you have and we'll add to it. When Mary came to us, she already had so much light in her life from the way she lived and how she loved Jesus Christ. When she was baptized, she continued to learn and grow and was a wonderful example of a friend to Jesus and a friend to all of us. I'm so grateful that I got to know this beautiful lady. Mary was a wonderful example to me of living a life full of good. She will be sure it's sorely missed, but I'm sure she's having a wonderful reunion with Chuck and other family members and friends, especially her best friend, her Savior, Jesus Christ. I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. doing great until that video and the second song just 
hit my heart. So I thank you so much. That was wonderful. I, okay, it's hard to be the last speaker because everything that I was going to say has been said. And especially Kay, your words were very similar to mine, but I think there's a reason why we say them again. And um, so I'm very humbled and honored that John, that Jim called me and asked me to say a few words about our beloved Mary. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I live three doors down from Jim and Mary and in beautiful Hidden Oaks, and I am so grateful that I that they are my friends. Um, Mary moved into our neighborhood at a time in her life when I felt she was bringing us a very special gift. Her gift was that she saw the grace of God in everyone she met. She looked for good in everyone whenever possible. And as I came to know her, I knew she had a love for the Bible, and she loved God. She knew Him. She seeked God diligently. I know one of her life missions was to serve others and strengthen them, especially her own family. Mary told me her favorite scripture was, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I truly came to know her in 2011, as her and Beth Robinson became my visiting teachers. I enjoyed her spiritual nature, and her and I connected. Well, I realized that Mary was looking for another gift, and the gift she was looking for was when Jim started bringing her to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Bishop Millar was the bishop at that time, and he invited Mary one day to speak before she became a member. And she said, quote, she spoke on Mother's Day. She said, when I spoke on Mother's Day in 2011, I wasn't yet a member of this church, and I have to admit, after that talk, I assured myself that it was a once-in-a-lifetime occurrence and I would probably never have to stand and talk in front of that many people again, ever. Well, she became a member, and Bishop Millar asked her to share her conversion story. And I'd like to read to you from her own words, from her talk that she gave, that she gave me that I have treasured all these years, how she became a member. When Jim and I married three years ago, I knew he was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I silently vowed that I would attend church with him, never realizing how much my life would change in the course of a couple of years. Jim never put any pressure on me to join the LDS Church, and I still remember vividly the first time I attended with him. It was my first time in a Mormon chapel. The sacrament service was quiet and reverent, and I felt at peace, although I did not partake of the sacrament. Gospel doctrine class was wonderful. I had always loved Bible study, especially the Wednesday night in in-depth classes, and I was fairly familiar with the scriptures, although the Book of Mormon would open a whole new world for me. When Sunday school ended that first day, the room filled with sisters for Relief Society, and I was in awe of the Spirit and the love that filled the room. I think it was in those moments that the Holy Spirit began to lead me on this journey. I knew these women were experiencing and living more of the love of Christ than I was. After several months attending church with Jim, I told him on the way home one Sunday that I really missed the Holy Communion service of the Episcopal Church. Jim told me that he would take me to the Episcopal Church any time I wanted to go. And then he took my hand and smiled that beautiful smile of his and said, Or, I can let you talk with the bishop. Hmm. I decided to continue praying, perhaps more earnestly than ever before, and I did for 
I did for several months, but never felt positively, absolutely in one, in any one direction. As I look back over that time, I believe I was using my mind too much and not giving my heart and soul equal time. I was not listening to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I remember the night I changed the way I was praying. praying. James, Heidi, and little Sam were here. <clears throat> After I prayed that night, I felt such a calmness. In my prayer, I told Heavenly Father humbly, <clears throat> sorry, that I would submit to his will for my life. If he wanted me to study the Mormon faith, I would. If it was what he wanted for my life, though, I would need a very solid sign, a living, breathing, and tangible evidence. The following morning, Sam, who was about two and a half then, and Leah were chasing each other around the upstairs when the doorbell rang. As I reached the door, I glanced over my shoulder to make sure Sam and Leah were not close enough to dash out the door. <clears throat> then I turned back to the door and gasped as I looked into the eyes of two young men standing on the porch. Two young men in white shirts, ties, name tags, and scriptures in hand. I had asked for a solid sign in my prayer the night before, and I knew immediately that Heavenly Father had answered my prayer. Standing before me were living, breathing, tangible missionaries. When the missionaries said they had a message they would like to share if I was interested, I said yes so quickly, almost before they had finished asking the question. If James had come upstairs just then, gently moved me out of the way, opened the door wider, and invited them in, I probably would have just stood there and continued staring at them. I've often wondered why we are as surprised as we are to have some prayers answered so quickly as with this prayer less than 24 hours. The scriptures tell us in Matthew 7, 12, in 3 Nephi, in Luke, and in Matthew again, ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. After setting a date for our first appointment to be later that same week, I hesitated and prayed that night, asking our Father in Heaven if those two young men really could teach me the things I needed to know. They were so young, and there were only two of them. A few days later, the missionaries knocked on our door again for the first appointment. I opened the door to find three young men on the porch. Remembering my prayer and without even thinking and totally lacking any tact, I blurted out, Why are there three of you? They were not intimidated. Just introduced the third young man as someone preparing to go on his mission, and they wanted him to experience an investigator firsthand. Thinking about it just now, I remember the following week when I opened the door and there were four. I didn't even ask why. I just invited them all in. A few weeks into our studies, I told the missionaries about my prayer and my absolute astonishment at finding them standing on the porch the very next morning. They grinned, looked at each other, and then admitted that I was the most enthusiastic investigator they had ever had, and how surprised they had been that morning. <clears throat> I was gently taught by these two, well, sometimes three, sometimes four, wise, spirited field missionaries who so thoroughly answered, answered every question I asked. However, every time they suggested, I think about setting a baptism day, I said that I still had too much to learn before I could get baptized. I certainly didn't feel qualified yet. Every time one of you spoke or gave a testimony, in church. I learned new something new and had a new understanding of something I had already known. But there was still so much more I needed to absorb. So one evening I prayed and I told Heavenly Father that I felt like I needed someone just to simply tell me straight out in front of witnesses that this was right for me. Set my baptism date. The very next Sunday during sacrament, Elder Heron 
gave a talk before he left on his mission. When we stood and walked to the pulpit, and when he stood and he walked to the pulpit, I knew he was going to say something I needed to hear. And near the very end of his talk, he said that many investigators treat baptism like a graduation when it is really a beginning. The next morning, I called and left a message for the missionaries. And I was baptized on September 17th of 2012. There is one sister that is probably on Zoom today. That sent me a couple of words that I could say for her. Sister Cheryl Glassford was one of her great friends. But she said this about Mary. Mary would tell me funny stories and make me laugh. She was a very happy, positive person and loved a good story. She had a notebook full of great stories and that she had personally written. She made chocolate chip cookies for Jim, and he always stood by close, overseeing her effort. When Carl and I were called to teach the temple prep class in our ward, Mary was our first participant. It was a delight to have the privilege of going to the temple with her for the first time. She had a beautiful testimony of Jesus Christ. So Mary came to our neighborhood and she gained a testimony of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it was her personal gift from our Savior to receive her own personal covenants that she had made with him in our church. She knew about Jesus, but she came to know him and hear him after her baptism. She learned that we will be together again, and we will all be received unto our Savior, Jesus Christ, with light and truth. As it has been said, Mary is one of the most Christ-like women that I have met. She knew she could do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth her. She had tremendous faith in all she did with her Heavenly Father by her side. God be with you until we meet again, Mary. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> what an honor to be here today and in a very short period of time learn more about Mary, and it's very, very obvious and clear by the repeating themes that she was a Christ-like person, and we're so thankful to all of you who have participated and, um, and taught us about Mary. Um, this week as we sat and, and helped Jim and talked to him about Mary and prepared for this program today, um, he, he sort of started off this theme and he recounted um, Mary's process of becoming a member of the church and Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and as he told that story um, you know I was very touched by the fact that Mary had always been a follower of Jesus Christ right this this was nothing new um, she was a Christ-like person before she came to Hidden Oaks and, and met all of us she was a student of the Bible and um, and she made a huge impact on our, our community for those members, um, family members or others who may be on Zoom or are not of our faith, um, I think you can find great comfort that Mary continued to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Right? That didn't change when she changed churches. She's the same person. And um, she was a dedicated follower of Christ and continued to embody all those things that we know and love about our Savior. Um, she loved Jim. She was kind to Jim. She was kind to everyone in our neighborhood. And um, again, we will not forget uh, her influence. Um, I'm a firm believer that God has placed truth um, all over the earth because he wants, um, he wants us back. And so that means we can all learn from each other and we can, in our search for truth, one of the unique beliefs that we have as, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ is that we have heavenly parents. 
and that we can become like become like them. And um, to me, it just makes sense that we we came from parents, and that um, they want us back, and we're going to be like become like them and share um, in all that they have. And I find great comfort today that Mary's returned to her heavenly parents, um, friends and family that have passed, and that one day Jim and Mary will be reunited. Um, and I'm sure that is going to be a very, very happy reunion. Um, because Mary's a disciple of Christ, she also believed in the resurrection. And um, I'd like to read today a description of a uh, resurrected being that we hear, that we learn from Joseph Smith um, when he saw um, Moroni, who came to bring um, the gospel of Jesus Christ back to the earth. And it's, it's an interesting description, and I want you to think of Mary um, as, as I read this. Uh, he had on a loose robe of most exquisite whiteness. It was a whiteness beyond anything earthly I had ever seen. Nor do I believe that any earthly thing could be made to appear so exceedingly white and brilliant. Not only was his robe exceedingly white, but his whole person was glorious beyond description, and his countenance truly like lightning. The room was exceedingly light, but not so very bright as immediately around his person. When I first looked upon him, I was afraid, but the fear soon left me. I can picture Mary like that, and I think um, that's a pretty amazing description of something that is going to happen to all of us because our, of our Savior Jesus Christ. And it is my hope and prayer that we can take what we've learned from Mary, what we've learned here today, take what we've, um, as one of the speakers felt, take what we felt, um, actually it was her, right, in her talk, um, that we can become better disciples of Jesus Christ, that we can be kind, that we can be loving, that we can impact our neighbors for good, um, and I, I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Our Father in Heaven, we are grateful to have the opportunity of attending this celebration of Mary's life. We're thankful for those who have taken the time to prepare remarks and video presentations to help us celebrate her life and the wonderful woman that she is. We're thankful for the many blessings of our association with her. I'm thankful for how she strengthened us in this world. We pray at this time for her family, for Jim and family members, that they might be comforted, that we might be comforted in the knowledge of the gospel, in the importance of thy sacrifice for us in the resurrection. We pray now to go with us as we depart, that we might have happiness in our heart, that we might have the joy of understanding that we will again see Mary and uh, strengthen our association with her. We're thankful for the many blessings that we enjoy, for the knowledge that we have. Let's do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.